Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation and by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 185 for February 25th, 2015. Hello, New Hams. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Heil. You probably have forgotten because I haven't been here so long. <laughs> and I'm back in the Ozarks after a long, what was it, a month on the road and still got more to go. But anyway, we uh, got back in so we could be here for uh, for tonight and um, put on my new Pro 7. And uh, boy, I, I got to tell you, I... <sighs> It's not a commercial. It's just the truth. This is the, the craziest, neatest headset ever. I uh, have to give my team back at uh, the plant uh, a kudos because it's really something. And of course, all the guys at K1, uh, K1N, when you worked uh, Navasa, they all had them. But um, sure like this baby. It's comfortable. It sounds, it sounds great. I have to tell you sometime how I did this because we did something very special in these speakers. And I'm on the Pro 10 tonight, the new little Pro 10. And just having a lot of fun back on the radios. I haven't really been on the air yet, but I'm going to be there after a while. We have a very special show tonight, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to get back here. Because we're going to do a new segment, and this, this segment is going to be called New Ham. And you'll learn a lot more about it. But I have people to help me, people that run this thing when I go out scattering about. <laughs> and we go down to Southern California and we meet up with Gordon West. Gordo, hi. And I see you. You have a guest. I, I do, Bob. And this guest came all the way back uh, along with me and others from the Yuma Ham Fest this past weekend. Wow. Hey, Chris. Uh, Chris N0 CSW Jesus, National Sales Manager. He had all this great gear in Yuma. And I said, Chris, you got to bring it by on your way home so we can see it here. Chris, welcome. And stopped in here fresh off the plane, Gordon, that's for sure. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, we have had a great, great time flying back, of course, with some weather here in Santa Ana. But uh, Yes, the Yuma Ham Fest was amazing. Out of all the ham fests I go to, it was one of the more amazing ham fests. There were 120 RVers there, about 1,000 attendees. I was on my feet the whole time. It was really, really great. I love getting out there and selling in a, in a good crowd, and the Yuma <laughs> crowd was absolutely excellent. That's it. Well, uh, Bob, we've warmed it up for you because this weekend, Bob Heil, along with Ray Novak with ICOM America and Martin Jew, are going to be at Ham Radio Outlet Plano, Texas. And then uh, a week later, on the 7th, I'll be there with Phil Parton of Kenwood along Common and A. BR Industries. And then on the 14th, you're going to see Chris again, live and direct at Plano Ham Radio Outlet, along with Dennis Machenbacher, along with Karen and Rod of RT. So lots of things happening. And Bob, we hope you have your ice skates on because you may need them this weekend. Bob, back to you. I, I, I'm afraid you're right. And hello and welcome, Chris. We, we, we look forward to having you on a lot and doing some things uh, with some of the new gear and the new technology that you guys are doing at Yesu. We need to more, hear more about that. I um, also want to say hello to Mr. Don. Don, how are you doing? We missed you, buddy. I'm awesome. Yeah, we missed you too. Good to have you back. We've got, uh, uh, the sun has been fairly active of late, and so we've got Dr. Tamitha Scove uh, at the tail end of the, the uh, uh, Newsline Headlines with the, the video piece here in just a few minutes. And a, a quick reminder, speaking of ham fest, one of the better ham fests in the country, if not the world, is the Huntsville, Alabama ham fest. That is the third oh, weekend yeah. in August. 
And of course, Yezu's there and ICOM's there and Kenwood's there and everybody else is there. And so is Amateur Radio Newsline with the Young Ham of the Year Award. And the nominating period is now open for that. You can go to arnewsline.org, click on the YHOTY button on the website and get all the details on how you can nominate a deserving Young Ham for the Young Ham of the Year Award. Bob? Oh, that's great. Appreciate you uh, keeping it all together while I was gone. And of course, one of the most important people is George. George, how are you doing? You've been burning any solder while I've been gone? Actually, don't we, or, uh, George isn't on right now. We didn't have enough Skypes for him, on. Bob. Okay. On Skype. Okay. Well, we're going to catch George in a little bit. I know that he's been doing some interesting projects. I've been watching some of his, uh, his beginning classes are really great if you haven't seen the ham class. Well, I told you earlier that we have a new segment here, and tonight is the, the start of that. We hope that uh, a lot of our, our audience can take part in this. We're, we're, we're capable of putting about 1,000 ham radio operators on the air. We've done that. We have emails, phone calls, and stuff over the past three years. We're so uh, absolutely blessed that we can bring uh, amateur radio to a lot of guys that have heard about it, didn't know, thought it was a big deal to get into it and so on, find out it's pretty easy. And we have our first new ham for this section that we're going to call new ham. I, I met this person about three or four years ago, HEC. This is a, a television station in St. Louis, came to me to do a documentary. And Christian Kudik was... The guy. He was the producer, the interviewer, and everything else. Well, we've become friends over that time, and uh, I'm I'm very very happy that he had beaten twenty him all these years, and he'd been beating on it himself. So, without further ado, I introduce you to the new ham KD zero STH. I call it St. Louis ham, but <laughs> Kristen, thanks for coming and welcome to this great hobby. Oh, thanks a lot, Bob. You know I. I really wouldn't be on the air now if not for you and a couple people you've put me in line with um, over the last few years and most recently getting on HF. Uh, that's been a, it's been a really big deal. There's so much to learn. I was licensed in 2012 and I think uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about our backstory, um, but I was freelance producing uh, the television station asked me to do a piece because I think I have a rock and roll background. Um, I've been on FM radio and things for over 20 years with a rock background, and I'm an audio guy. So they're like, you do the Bob Heil bio profile. I'm like, cool. So we did that, and we got to meet, and that was sort of you rekindled something in me that my father started probably in the 1970s, the mid-70s. He was a citizen band guy during the CB craze of the 70s. So he got me, he really planted a seed in me with radio, but that led me to a broadcast career. Uh, meeting you in probably 2009 took it to a new place. I remember you saying, this is a microphone I'm working on, and I'm looking around like I'm in a, a spaceship with all these beautiful radios, and it really ignited this ember that had always been uh, in me there. And uh, there's the picture of my dad. That's, that's cool. Anyway, back to you. I, I, I took knew, a little too much. No, I knew that you were uh, uh, very passionate because of your father. And then you showed me the, your, your Hammerlin, the HQ-129X receiver that he had. And that was really great, the old receiver. And then you called me one day and said, look what I bought. And, well, there's the receiver. That was, that was your dad's receiver. Is that correct? Yeah, my dad owned that one. That was, I don't know where he picked that up, and I'm not even positive he had it on the air. It's a sentimental piece for me. As you can see, it needs a little love. It looks great under the hood, but it definitely needs a little <laughs> love. And I've got a W0HRO Ken, who's another, you know, one of my Elmers that you put me in track with. He's going to help me restore that. I hope so. We're going to spend some time with it. There's no rush. <laughs> Uh, it's just a sentimental piece for me, so I'd, I'd like to put it up here, you know, somewhere with the Drake at some point. 
Uh, I, you sent me some great pictures, and I want uh, Brian to roll those through while we're talking. You you wanted to get on the air, and you it seemed like you were very passionate in the vintage gear. And boy, did you! You picked up a, a was it a Drake? I did, and I labored over that decision. I think this is a great segment for you to introduce because there's so much for a new ham. You know, I had the luxury to have you. You turned me on to Lanny N Zero J Z and Ken W0HRO. And these are great guys who have patience for me because I, I'd like to know the answers. I, I've got an inquisitive, curious mind, and I think that's what's helped me in my career, right? And I've had you. And I don't know how you do right. it and how you keep up the stamina, Bob, <laughs> frankly. Just my emails alone <laughs> must flip, flip you out. But yes, I did no. settle with the Drake TR7, and it's a beast. It's re I haven't been able to blow it up, and I've been very safe with it, but it's it's a good, solid old rig, and that's what uh, you told me to go for. Exactly. And, of course, I pointed you that we showed a picture. Put that picture back up of Ken standing beside just a few of his great vintage gear. This is a real master, W0HRO. He's on 3885 a lot on AM. I don't think you'll ever find him on sideband much. But he's a great guy and knows so much and has a tremendous workshop. So we're we're proud to have him as a friend. And he, he fixes my stuff, too, because I can't stay home long enough. That's just a small part of his uh, station. Well, Christian, I really appreciate you being here. And, and I want you to, to, to take a minute or so here in closing to give a, a, a little bit of, of cheer to some of the guys that have maybe sat around saying, I'd like to be a ham, but I don't know if I could. You're the perfect example of that. If you want to do it, you can do it. And you did it. I think what helped was, you know, after we spoke, you, you know, I really wanted to study. I had time. I think there's a lot of people who have a lot going on in their lives. Um, you know, I've had children since I've been licensed. And a lot of time, you know, you, you, you're balancing a lot. And the study of it seems intensive. You sent me to Gordon's books. And there's some other online things that help me as well. Uh, study guides. You can go at your own pace. The one thing I'd say is, you know, you spend a lot of time with the writing in those books and, and, you know, you memorize a lot of things, but what mi what's missing is perhaps the practical side. Uh, here I am an amateur extra now and I need so many, so much help just to sort of point me in the right direction. And luckily I have that. So you can do it. You just need to chunk out that time and, and apply yourself to the FCC stuff, which is the written stuff that we all have to take. And then hopefully, maybe you go to a club. I was fortunate I had you and you put me on the right track. But maybe go to the club and sort of find what phase of this you really love. This thing has this, I'm talking about, you know, this, this hobby has so many layers, so many different shades of things that you can get into. You're, you're liable to find it there. Say you live out in the country and you're not near anyone else. Well, check into a club, meet some people, talk to them, and you kind of whittle that down to what, oh, I like antenna building, this guy over here, you know, but you need that Elmering, and I think finding that person's really essential. You can't really do it on your own. I don't know. You tell me. You're, you guys know. <laughs> but for me, I think your well, Elmers, if, if you could, right, Dr. Bob, if you could go back and talk to your Elmers right now, wouldn't you do it? Knowing what you know, wouldn't you still do it? I'd love to do that, but uh, they're not right, here. Of course. Well, it's of been, course. But it's you been would, really, right? really. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, Larry Burroughs, who was the chief engineer at KMOX there in St. Louis, uh, he was the man. And he's just one of probably a hundred or more over my lifetime. But uh, I applaud you for getting on HF from the beginning. That's the real part of ham radio. And uh, I appreciate you uh, being on with us tonight. I'll look forward to working you on the air here in the next few days if I can uh, stay home long enough. But uh, we'll get home when I, from HRO. Well, I, I, I thank you very much, 7-3 uh, to you. Best regards. And I appreciate you taking the time to be here, Christian. You're welcome. 7-3, everybody. 
Okay. Gordo, I can't have a better opening for you than one of your students, so to speak. So uh, uh, let's uh, switch back to California and uh, you and Chris tell us about some new technology. But how is that for one of your students? You got to be feeling really good, Gordo. Wow, that is terrific. And Christian, thanks so much. And thanks for bringing up the fact that both of you said get started on HF as well as 2 meters and 440. And uh, our Chris right here uh, shares that same thought. And Chris, everybody was like looking at this new radio. I understand it is taking the place of my venerable 897 that I've taken to Christmas Island so many times. This is the new 991. Wow. For beginners, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, Gordon, I would love to say that this radio is taking the place of the 991. I'm not sure that any, or excuse me, the 897. I'm not sure that anything could take the place of the <laughs> 897. It was a great radio, but we decided after about 16 years of service, it was time to bring some new technology to the market. But not just new technology. We wanted to make sure if we're, uh, you know, for creating a new radio on the market that we also appeal to the new ham. And uh, Bob, that's why I'm glad I heard your new ham segment there, because this is really a radio designed for the new amateur radio operator. Uh, it's touchscreen design makes it really easy to use um, with spectrum scopes built into it. But not only that, it has everything out of the box that you need to have a good ham radio experience. Now, you've got it tied into Chris looks like your uh, laptop yeah. as well. <laughs> And uh, we're uh, now you can see it big yeah, screen. Have, uh, Ham Radio Deluxe running here, which uh, is the first piece of software to support the 991 in its entirety. Um, so we have some uh, digital master 780 running over here. As you can see, we're running PSK 31. <clears throat> and we are doing it all through uh, one single USB wow. cable. There's nothing else to it. The digital mode interface is built right in. The antenna tuner is built right in. It's got 100 watts right out of the box of band scope. It's just a really good radio for the beginner. Oh, that's terrific. Well, it was certainly the hit at Yuma, and uh, who knows uh, when we'll see it next at another upcoming show, but I know where we'll see it next. Now, you've brought some other rigs as well that uh, garnered a lot of attention. What have you got? Yes, we did. We actually brought uh, the FT1DR here today, which is our handheld, and it's one of our flagship handhelds that we have out on the market right now. <laughs> which also, you know, has a great price point for getting into it. These these radios run under $300. They're dual band, and they have APRS and digital capability built right into them. So, wow. Yeah. And you have mobile as well? A mobile as well, the FTM 400, which also has a very nice color touchscreen display on it. Very easy to use for the new ham. Uh, something you can get into and start running APRS and uh, digital data and uh, all the things that you would want in amateur radio. So you're not limited with any of these products. Well, that's terrific. Well, Chris, thank you for sharing these rigs uh, with me. Now, I understand you're going to share some rigs with two of the Ham Nation viewer and listeners? Uh, yes, we are. And we have brought uh, two FT1Ds today that are going to be wow. available uh, in, the, in the future here. We'll uh, be talking to you more about that so we'll be giving those away to two lucky viewers on ham nation wow well we'll have a contest and uh, we'll give you all the details viewers and listeners and uh, that's terrific well chris thank you for uh taking time off on your way home from yuma to stop by here the last minute and uh, open up a box that everybody was looking to see what's inside and uh, we just wish you the best success with your job with yezu over to you Thank you very much, Gordon. I appreciate that. And um, also, I want to say, Christian, welcome to the to the ham community. You know, it's great to uh, to see new hams out there, and that's what we're uh, we're trying to appeal to. So uh, that's the story here at this end in Southern California. Weekend after next, uh, I'll be in. Um, uh, let's see. Weekend after next, I'm with Phil at uh, Ham Radio Outlet Plano. And then that following weekend, I'll be in Palm Springs, a local ham fest here in Southern California. So, Bob, that's the schedule. These are the rigs. Back to you. All right. Well, I appreciate you being there uh, and making that happen uh, uh, with these new radios, Chris. It's really informative. So thanks a lot. We'll look forward to having you back. And I'll meet up with you on one of the shows or something, I'm sure. If not, when you come to Joplin, why uh, stop by? <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention before I uh, get out of here and give it back to Don. 
Uh, if anybody wanted to see that piece that Christian did, it was really a neat piece. I, he did a fabulous job on that. You can just put HEC TV and my name, HEC TV, and then Bob Heil. It'll come up, but uh, there's a, a banner of it, and there it is right there. Uh, thanks, Brian, for bringing that up, and we'll put it in the show notes. It's just well, well produced and uh, gets into some of the... Uh, some of the things about ham radio as well as uh, our company. So that's where we are. Well, thanks a lot uh, for that uh, wonderful Jesu Expo, and we'll uh, we'll look again to see you guys soon. So, Don, I guess we head back south and see what's going in your world. It's sure good to see you. Look at that. Hey, there's an old Jesu. school Jesu radio. There's an old school FD530, the first real live handheld I think I ever bought as a new ham. And... Uh, this thing still works. It's got a cracked uh, ribbon cable in it, but um, but it does still work. The battery's shot in it because I can't power it on. But man, Yezu makes some some good stuff. I've got actually I've got three Yezu handhelds on my desk here, and and along with my Icom, so and a Kenwood HF. So I've got a little bit of everybody over here. They're all good and they all work and they all do different things. And you know another great resource that I found right after becoming licensed as a ham in. In 95, of course, I was exposed to it in 75 through CB Radio. CB Radio is a great, great uh, gateway drug to ham radio, was Amateur Radio Newsline. I'm tooling, tooling along through the repeaters, and all of a sudden, I hear this newscast. And it's like, wow, this is cool as this can be. It, there's a newscast? And now I'm part of it. Been part of it for the last 20 years or so, and uh, pretty excited about that. And now we're branching into uh, bringing it to you here on Ham Nation as well. So let's go ahead and get into the Ham Nation Amateur Radio Newsline, Headlines of the Week. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 1,953, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, February 25, 2015. The AWRL has asked a Massachusetts company that plans to conduct experimental transmissions over wide portions of the HF spectrum to either avoid amateur radio allocations or to announce the times and frequencies of their transmissions in advance. Last fall, the FCC granted Maitri Corporation of Bedford, Massachusetts, a two-year Part 5 experimental license, WH2XCI. This allows Maitri to operate 21 transmitters at 10 fixed New York and Massachusetts sites. But in a February 12th letter to Maitri, ARRL counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, says that it will not be possible for Maitri to operate these transmitters within the amateur radio service allocations without causing harmful interference to a large number of amateur radio operators on an ongoing basis. Imlay added that if Maitri does not agree to avoid ham radio bans or to announce times and frequencies of transmissions ahead of time, it will ask the FCC to rescind the company's experimental license or to impose a prior notification requirement in real time for each and every use of the transmitters authorized at each site. Skeeter Nash in 5 ash More information can be found at the link in the full edition of this week's Amateur Radio Newsline report. With the K1N Navassa Island operation now over, Heard Island appears to be next up as far as the top 10 most wanted entities in the DXCC program list. With the story from down under, here's Graham Kemp, VK4BB. Heard will rise to number four in the DX publication's most wanted list. But this is, of course, always subject to change due to those who participate in the poll each year. It will be number five in the club log most wanted list, but this also changes based on those who upload their log files. Based on this need, the next herd operation, sponsored by Cordell Expeditions, is tentatively scheduled for the 2015 Southern Hemisphere summer. The voyage to the island is scheduled for November 10 to December 22, with actual operation running from about November 22 to December 8. The call sign to be used will be VK0EK. Herd Island was last activated 18 years back in 1997. Before that, an operation from Heard was part of a 1980s era scientific expedition chronicled in the Australian theatrical motion picture Voyage to the White Volcano. On that expedition, the scientific team relied totally on the ham radio operators for communications with the outside world. K1N was wildly successful, logging just under 139,000 QSOs with nearly 36,000 unique calls. We have a full wrap-up report in this week's Amateur Radio Newsline. If you're interested in emergency communications, you'll want to attend the 2015 Dayton Hamvention. Here's Skeeter Nash. 
The Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications will again offer its Auxiliary Communications, or OXCOM, course May 12th to the 14th in Dayton, Ohio, just prior to Hamvention 2015. The intensive three-day course provides facilitated lectures, student exercises, and interactive discussions. Applicants must meet all prerequisites and provide documentation to attend this class. The class is limited to 50 qualified students. More than 1,000 amateur radio operators have completed the course, which trains qualified hams to assist local, county, and state government with emergency backup communication. Details and registration requirements are available on the web at hamvention.org. Carol Perry, WB2MGP, has announced the opening for nominations for the Young Ham Lends a Hand Contest. Any licensed ham 18 years or younger is eligible. A simple email to Carol detailing why the nominated youngster should win is all that is required. The young ham should be someone who is meeting one of our amateur radio basic tenets of giving back and service. The winner will be announced at the 2015 Dayton Hamvention Youth Forum where he or she will receive $100. All nominations should be by email sent to carolperry at ix.netcom.com before April 1st. By the way, Carol spells her first name, C-A-R-O-L-E. And a reminder that the nominating period is now open for the Amateur Radio Newsline Young Ham of the Year Award. Full information and a nominating form can be found by clicking the Y-H-O-T-Y button on the Newsline website. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, and Graham Kemp, VK4BB, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And now, here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of February 25th. The sun has picked up in activity this week, not so much in terms of flares, but in terms of solar storms and ejections. We've had a couple wispy solar storms uh, about center disk, one there and one there, and these are Earth-directed, so we might feel some effects around the 24th and 25th, but pretty minor. The big stories are the prominence eruption that we had here that you barely see. If you blink, you miss it, but on the backside, it's a gorgeous eruption, and we also have this gorgeous uh, prominence eruption that happens here. Bam! You see it right there? That erupted, but we also have a synergistic, almost sympathetic eruption that occurs right there. And that part might be Earth-directed that might actually hit us somewhere around the 28th. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see we are way below the uh, seafloor when it comes to flare activity. And this quiet is going to continue to last easily for the next three or four days and probably uh, beyond that because there's just not a lot of flaring active regions on the disk or even about to rotate onto the east limb at this time. Although we haven't had much problems with flares lately, we did have some enhanced radiation levels due to that prominence eruption that occurred just behind the west limb. As we, you can see, we actually had elevated radiation levels starting around the 21st that lasted for several days uh, and died down around the 23rd. And these uh, elevated particle levels cause uh, problems with GPS and amateur radio communications at high latitudes, as you can see in this map here. So if you are a ham radio operator and you had issues uh, over the past couple days, this is probably why. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the next few days, we really are remaining flatlined. There's very little activity on the Earthside disk right now. NOAA is only giving us about a 1% chance for an M-class flare over the next few days, and I'm extending that further out over the next five days because there's just not any activity in sight. All of the active regions right now that are on the Earth-facing disk are very sleepy, so you amateur radio operators should be very, very happy. Uh, we're not, we shouldn't see any disruptions. The only thing is that one that once that old region 2280 rotates back in the next three or four days, it may have a, a slight increase in the flare production, but uh, seriously doubt it at this point. Also, we did just exit a, a slightly elevated levels of particle radiation, but uh, those levels are expected to remain normal now into the foreseeable future. There you go. Good stuff. Check her out at spaceweather.tv, and you can also follow uh, Dr. Scove on sky or on twitter at tamitha scove i forgot to put uh, the lower third down there for her but at t-a-m-i-t-h-a-s-k-o-v at tamitha scove on twitter so good stuff thank you dr t we appreciate that so should be some good band conditions for doing some some dx and you know efficient multi-band operation is the holy grail for for us 
But what if you don't have room for a whole bunch of antennas? A lot of us don't. I don't. Well, well, I do, but I just, <laughs> I just can't put them up. Well, DX Engineering has made the Quest a lot easier to follow. You know, one of the best antennas you can use for DX is a vertical. And one of the best verticals out there is Hustler. They make some great multi-band verticals that allow you to work HF without having to put up a tower base in your living room. I don't think my wife would appreciate that. And DX Engineering has complete step-by-step -step solutions for amateur radio operators who want to put these hustlers up and get them on the air and on the air easy. They're excellent for the newly licensed ham that we've been talking about tonight. You want to get started on HF, you want to skip the tricky component matching process. There are three of the kits available based around hustlers, four band, five band, and six band verticals. That's up to 80 to 10 meter coverage through a single vertical antenna. And each one uses an efficient design. Individually precision tuned Q traps, broadband performance it will give you phone, CW, and digital all on one stick. The multiband verticals from Hustler will handle full legal limit and they can withstand up to 55 mile an hour winds. So you can also upgrade and repair uh, very easily with optional parts that are available through DX Engineering as well. The kit includes the antenna, the DX Engineering high quality patented radial plate with exclusive patented tilt base. A set of radial staples to get those things down onto the ground, radial wire and several key brackets, connectors, and all the hardware that you need to make installation an absolute breeze. Now, the, the, and the tilt base is just the coolest thing. It's patented. It's exclusive. It means you can very easily lower that antenna for wind, housing restrictions, or just to do a little bit of maintenance on it. And the real secret to the kit is the comprehensive instruction manual from DX Engineering, written by experts for you. It's a must-have guide to setting up and tuning your Hustler multiband vertical. And it's 60 pages long. This is not no pamphlet, gang. This is a book. 60 pages full of special tips for max performance, covering everything from proper guide to effective radial system design. And it comes bundled with each of the kits. Plus, it's available separately. Check it all out at dxengineering.com. And if you already have the mounting set up in the radios, you can also get packages that just include a vertical antenna and the DX Engineering Hustler Vertical Instruction Manual. I want you to go uh, right now to dxengineering.com slash hamnation. You know, DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the business. If you get your order in by 10 o'clock Eastern tonight and it's in stock, it will be on a truck headed your way tonight. Proven products, expert advice, DX Engineering helping you shrink the globe. Grab your catalog. Uh, shop online 24-7, 365 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And thank you so much, DX Engineering, for your support of Ham Nation. And look, right here, here they are in, in the catalog. The, uh, the Hustler antennas, why, conveniently, right there on page 73. Is that not the perfect page? Page 73 <laughs> in the DX Engineering Catalog. It's uh, it's absolutely perfect. And um, so there you go. Get on the air and have fun. And also, fire up the soldering iron. George, are you here tonight? Hi, Don. Yes, and we need the soldering iron on tonight. It's a little chilly up here. We bit. didn't get any snow. We got a little bit of ice here, and I... I I don't think y'all got either one down there, did you? No. No, it's 40 degrees right now, and it's actually uh, chilly. It's been, we've had a lot of rain, but, uh, but yeah, no we snow. Have to. Yeah. yeah. Well, we thought we might have some snow, but we probably not this year, it doesn't look like. That's okay, though. Um, they got some up in the north part of the state, and we got a little ice this week, but nothing too serious there. Just want to let everyone know if you're in the Orange, Texas area, that's uh, South Texas. Or uh, Western Louisiana this weekend, I'm going to be at the Orange, Texas Ham Fest at the Jefferson County uh, Amateur Radio Club and Orange Amateur Radio Club's Ham Fest. It's going to be at the Orange County Convention and Expo Center in Orange, Texas. I'll be speaking there Saturday morning and uh, looking forward to a great time there. And maybe we'll run into a few of you. Well, you know, um, Randy has got a new video for us this week where he built a fill strength meter using one of those cheap Harbor Freight uh, digital voltometers. meters. I haven't watched it myself, so let's, let's watch it together here and see what he did. Hi, Randy, K7AGE. I was looking in my February QST in the hints and kinks section on page 71, Richard KB3 Victor Zulu Lima wrote a little article about building a field strength meter inside of a digital voltmeter. I thought that would make an interesting project for us. So what is a field strength meter? Well, it's a meter to measure the field, your RF field, coming off your antenna. Now, this is not a 
calibrated piece of test gear. It's, it's not going to tell you watts or volts per meter or anything like that, but it will give you a voltage number that's just relative. So if you're doing some testing between antennas, you could say you have a quarter wave antenna and get a an reading, then maybe switch to your beam or your dipole and get a reading with that, and now you'll be able to see if one is better than the other. It's just a handy thing to have around to sense the amount of RF that's being radiated. So we're going to build this field strength meter inside this digital voltmeter. And what's kind of handy about these, these are the ones that harbor freight cells. I think they're like $15. And if you have the right coupons, you can get these for free. Sometimes you have to purchase something to get them. Sometimes if you get the right coupon, you can get a free digital voltmeter without even purchasing anything. So this is what we're going to use. We're going to have a little antenna that we're going to mount on the top of the meter. It feeds through a 0.05 microfarad capacitor to a pair of germanium 1N34 diodes. These need to be germanium, not silicon, so the meter is more sensitive. A 470 puff capacitor to ground, then a 50K pot with a 0.01 microfarad capacitor to ground. The switch is here for safety so that when using the meter for normal voltage measurements, you don't have any voltage up on the antenna. So here's a picture of how Richard <coughs> used a little piece of perf board it fits in the meter here up above the circuit board. Here's the freebie Harbor Freight meter and let's take a look at the inside. The back is held on with two screws. You can pop those off then the back comes comes right off. So here's the meter. You got the battery, the circuit board and here's the display and there's a lot of room behind the display here. It's a piece of perf board that I'm going to use to go in the meter and this is what the, the full size of the board it started out to be and I just kind of it's really hard to see but I kind of laid out where the parts are going to go on the board I've cut the board down to this size and this was what will fit inside the meter here to hold everything and I'm going to use a new soldering iron for this uh, for this project uh, this is an ISO tip soldering iron what's kind of nice about this is that it's a battery powered soldering iron and it just drops in the charger here when you're not using it to charge up and it comes with a couple different tips. It takes a few seconds for it to warm up, but I thought this would be an interesting project to try out the new ISO tip. And this is a model uh, 7700, a wireless soldering iron. So I'm going to start mounting some of the parts on the board here. So here's my little board. Here's the first capacitor. This is the 0.05 that's going to be used for the antenna. I'm just going to poke that in here in the end. Bend the leads over a little bit. Bend them over flat here. To the board so keep the parts falling out and that's how I'm going to to solder so I'm going to place the first dial this dial is going to go next to the capacitor here and this is um, one end is going to be at the junction of the opposite end from where the antenna gets connected okay the second dial <clears throat> is going to mount across the bottom edge of the board here so I want the um, anode end going to be common with the other dial so it's going to, I'm going to put it in, in these holes right here. So here's the bottom side of the board. And what they kind of do is bend the leads over so they kind of touch each other. Because that's going to be the junction where I solder. Next I'm going to mount the uh, position to 470 uh, puff capacitor at the end of the diode. And it's going to go here. Basically I'm going to run the ground across the, uh, this top edge of the board here. Next, I have a little trim pot, a 50K pot. And I'm going to mount that in here. So there's the pot. And the next thing is to mount the uh, 0.01 capacitor. And it's going to go next to the pot here. And put it in there. And turn it over. And bend the leads. So there's basically all the parts on the board. All that's left to do is uh, basically solder them together. This is a view of the bottom of the board. You can see I have the leads all bent over. Uh, group in together for the various junctions. So here's one. Here's a long lead from one of the capac capacitors, which will be my ground bus. And there's a couple other junctions there. So we'll get out the uh, the ISO tip and some solder. And this has a light on it, which is handy too. So I'm going to heat this up. A little solder on the uh, iron. Just going to kind of put it on all three leads there 
and feed it some solder and there they nice and silver across all of those and they're kind of loose this isn't uh, the greatest technique in the world let's get uh, I got too much solder here bang it off in the waste basket fling off the excess solder Here's the button heat it up I got these two here here we go feed it some solder got it I got that one Solder those two wires together. And when you're done, just drop the iron back in the charger. I think that all looks good. I can kind of pick away here. I don't see any wires separating from the solder. And I think I've got it. Okay, so here's the back in the, here's from the meter where it's gonna go. And I'm gonna take some of these caps that are sticking up high and just bend them over real gently. Here we go the profile down. Now this is going to mount in here like this. It's going to sit in there like that. Um, this is the junction here with the capacitor where the antenna is going to go. So I'm going to use an RCA jack up in the top for the antenna and I have a toggle switch that I can fit over here on the end. So I got lots of room. A couple marks on here where I'm going to put the antenna jack. Here's a little trick. Um, I'm going to use the iron here and heat that up, I'm just going to touch that right at that crosshair and melt a little hole. Here we go. And that'll be for my drill. All right, I got the switch mounted and the RCA jack. And, and so the board will go in there like that. Okay, so now I have all the wires to the board. I have a red wire going up to the RCA. The brown black wire is to the ground terminal and the blue goes through the switch and to the positive terminal. The other thing I've done is taken a, about a 19 inch piece of some heavy wire that I had and uh, soldered into an RCA plug to use for my antenna. Okay, I have the meter all put together. I have the switch up to use the 19 inch whip. I have it on the 20 volts DC scale. I have my ICOM V80HT. I can use it as a uh, RF source here. I'm gonna hold it about two feet away on low power, K7AGE, there it is, 0.4 volts. I'm gonna take it to medium power, 1.3, so from 0.4 to 1.3, that's a relative uh, increase. Let's go to high power, K7AGE, about 2.2, 2. .2, 2 .2. You can see it kind of varies as I move around. So the meter does show you the difference in the field intensity as I change power on, on the meter. So thanks for watching. This is Randy, K7AGE. Oh, neat project there, Randy. You know, some people in the chat room were saying they preferred a fluke meter or a Beckman or, or one or the other, and that, you know, this was a, a pretty cheap meter. And I think that was the point, that it was cheap or maybe even free. And you really don't care about the accuracy of it because this is just a relative fill strength is what you're measuring with this. So anything that gives you an indication is, is going to be good enough for that. So uh, neat little project, and it really didn't cost hardly anything to put together there. That little isotip soldering iron that he had there, I've used those before. It's, it's been a lot of years, but I used to keep one in my uh, toolbox that I could carry around the transmitter sites when I just needed something to, to solder a connection real quick. Those things are pretty handy to have available. Won't do really big stuff, but for little circuit board stuff and small wires and all, they, they do work pretty uh, pretty good. Well, last week I asked a question. In my Raspberry Pi, I installed a DV3000 board. What does that board do? And we had an answer here from Kevin Waskowski, N8OWL. And he said the DV3000 board allows the Raspberry Pi to be used with D-Star. And that's correct, Kevin. So we're going to send you this copy of Morse code breaking the barrier from MFJ and Dave Finley in one IRZ. A great book to help you get your Morse code speed up. Now, for next week, we've got another question. And that is, what reading on an SWR meter 
indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the feed line. This comes from the amateur radio technician's class exam. And our choices are A, 2 to 1, B, 1 to 3, C, 1 to 1, or D, 10 to 1. The question again, what reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the feed line? If you think you know that, send it to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com. You could be next week's winner. What are you going to win? Well, you're going to win the Boy Scouts of America Electronics Merit Badge Series book. It's a good little book here on electronics. It's got a lot of interesting uh, projects and, and just basic information about electronics there. If you win this, look it over yourself before you give it to a Boy Scout because it, it is some good information in there. Amnationcontestgmail.com, and you could win. And now it's time to bring Dell on in and see what we've got in the way of viewer videos this week. Hi, Dale. Okay, George. Yeah, we've got three this evening. Uh, we've got... Uh, an event report from the UK, a DIY how-to, and then a look at a number of ham radio apps for your smartphone. We'll move to the uh, first video from the UK first. The huge Canvey Rally is now 40 years old, and they celebrated that with a birthday cake and a whole lot more. And one lucky raffle winner got to work with the Local emergency helicopter crew for a day. Pete M0PSX sent this report to Ham Nation. Sunday, the 1st of February 2015, saw the 30th Canvey Radio Rally. This annual event is organized by the South Essex Amateur Radio Society. Doors opened at 10.30 a.m., but before then, there were some very early starts and a lot of hard work to make sure everything was ready. As queues were gathering, here's a glimpse behind the scenes. With everything set up and ready, the doors were opened at 10.30am and so began a very busy rally. Very well done to the team at Sears for organising another successful rally, and especially to the unsung heroes in the kitchen for the tea, coffee and of course the famous bacon butties. The 30th Canvey Rally held a raffle in aid of the Essex Air Ambulance, who were in attendance for the day. In 2014, Essex Ham spent the day with the Essex Air Ambulance crew. Thanks Dave, that's all received. Um, yeah, I'm a critical care paramedic here. I'm on with Nikki, who's our pilot today, and um, Matt, who's our doctor. Louise Rosson, and I'm a critical care paramedic. The majority is about bringing the team which can provide care that a hospital can, but to the scene and trying to improve the patient's care right there at the scene rather than the delay of getting to hospital. My name's Dr Matt Samara. The air ambulance becomes the cherry on the icing of the cake, which you would want absolutely when you have your car crash or your heart attack. Captain Nicky Smith, I'm the pilot of the Essex Air Ambulance. It's a really difficult job continuing to raise that huge sum, £440,000 every month. It's your air ambulance. It belongs to you, the community, and uh, we can't fly without you. Prizes donated for the raffle included a weather station, a Lenovo tablet, a Baofeng VHF UHF handheld, a Roberts clock radio, 50 pounds of components, plus an RSGB book. The raffle was drawn by Steve, M1ACB, the RSGB's Region 12 manager. After the raffle, a surprise on stage appearance. Right, okay guys, so some of you know us, the Essex Repeater Group was founded just a few weeks back, 40 years ago. So in January 1975 in Chelsea we spun out, and on the table there we've got a 40th birthday cake. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, dear E.R.G. Happy birthday to us. Now, if you'd like to get help yourself to be Through the generosity of visitors to the rally and Sears, £300 was handed over by Sears President Dave Speechley to Carol and Clive for the Essex Air Ambulance Fund. We hope you've enjoyed our quick look at the Canvey Rally 2015 and well done to the team from Sears for putting on a great 30th rally. This feature was brought to you by Essex Ham, supporting amateur radio in Essex. Well, we appreciate that report, Pete. And moving on now, DIY is big today. And one of our viewers uh, jumped right in the fray and uh, sent us a video to show you how you can make a $60 plus programming cable for your radio for all around $22. Jeremy Jones, VA3ZTF reports. So I recently bought myself a uh, Kenwood D710, uh, good radio, but it does not come with the programming cable. And the local shops around here want about 60 bucks for this cable before uh, taxes and shipping. Uh, I was able to get onto DigiKey, order up the parts for around $20 and uh, make the cable myself. So uh, here we go, it's a fairly straightforward process. And uh, this is what we've got. So the cable is a 8-pin mini DIN male, 6-foot uh, cable, and it terminates into just uh, bare wires, perfect length for going into the DB9 connector. A DB9 female, 9-pin, and the plastic back shell components. So Kenwood gives us the pinout uh, showing both the male DIN connector and the female DB9. Uh, just be aware that it's showing that looking towards the pins or the connectors you would put in either the computer uh, or the radio. So the, that is the front, not the opposite side where you would solder and uh, it indicates that as well. I also have the pinout or the color code from the cable manufacturer gave us that. Uh, one thing to note though is pin two on that indicates that it's a purple wire. On mine it was actually a white wire and uh, just a simple check with the ohmmeter uh, verified that for me. So with all that uh, let's get to some soldering. There's only uh, five connections that need soldered. Uh, I soldered the pins first and then uh, clipped the unused leads. I guess it probably would have been easier to uh, to clip the unused ones first, but uh, so be it. So we'll uh, solder up some wires and carry on from there. So when it's all finished, uh, you should have this uh, five connectors going in and the uh, unused leads clipped off. The back shell goes together relatively straightforward. Uh, just goes in there, the cables clamp down, the uh, two screws to hold the, uh, the connectors together, uh, slide in, and then the whole thing just gets uh, clamshelled shut and uh, snaps together. So nothing, uh, no major thing there, just make sure everything's lined up. Okay, so let's uh, get this all hooked up here. Make sure your pins are lined up and uh, plug it into the back of the control head. Uh, I had to take mine off to the mount uh, so I could see it. Uh. Well, Jeremy's video goes on to show how to program the Kenwood DM710. The full video is available with all of tonight's videos at hamnationvideos.info. We can't get away from it. Smartphones are now an integral part of our hobby and our life. To help hams find out about the software they need, 
Dan in 9LVS, the Ham Nation Wiki editor, and uh, the webmaster at hamnationvideos.info produced this one. This is Apple iOS Apps for Amateur Radio. In this video, we're going to talk about apps that you can use for your iOS device. This is the iTunes Store. As you can see when we look up Amateur Radio, there are a lot more apps available. Let's start out with Hamtest Prep. This is a study guide application that gives you a full list of questions in the question pool. From the main menu, you can also take practice exams or see your test history. It also gives you a complete breakdown of part 97. When you take a practice exam, it'll look like this. And when you've completed your exam, you'll get a nice proficiency percentage from the exam. Next, let's look at QRZ for Apple. When we look up W1AW, we get all the information we'd expect to see from the standard QRZ page. We can also see its location, and if we want, we can actually see a standard QRZ page. Then there's Repeater Book, a nice little application that finds repeaters that are close to you. For instance, the AH6LE repeater is only 0.9 miles away. And as we scroll down the list, we see that the N7ASM repeater is only 4.8 miles away. If we click on the repeater listing, we get all the particulars about that repeater. There's also filters that we can select which repeaters we will see, as well as which modes we want to use. You can also set auto location. That way you only see the repeaters that are nearest to you. We also have OpenAPRS, a nice little APRS app. From the main screen on the app, it gives you a working compass, as well as access to all the app's features. This area here gives you your exact location, as well as some of the setup features. We can also do a search and see when the last time one of our fellow hams was on, as well as the ability to message back and forth. We're also able to look people up on a map as well. There's also an Echolink app. This is very similar to what you'd see on your desktop. First thing that you're going to want to do is make sure that the connection to Echolink is working. All you have to do is log into the test server and then transmit some audio and listen to it back. Then, of all, you need to pick a country that you want to talk to. From that list, you'll see everybody in that country that's on Echolink. Once you've connected, you'll get a screen that looks like this. This tells you everybody that's on that node. Then all you have to do is click transmit and you're in the conversation. And let's not forget iCluster, a neat little app to catch spots in the DX cluster. From the main page, you'll see all the current DX spots and who sent that spot. If you click on one of the spots, you'll come up to this page, which gives the spotting details, as well as the information from the herd station. You can also connect to numerous different DX clusters. There's also an area for alerts and filters. You can filter by band, by mode, by zone, and by call. This app also has a very nice link to QRZ. And last but not least, Ham Antenna Calculator for iOS. This antenna app is set up to work either English or metric and can calculate eighth wave, quarter wave, half wave, five eighths wave, or a full wave antenna. You just punch in your frequency and it comes up with the length. In this case, for a dipole, it's telling us what a half wave length is and what a quarter wave length is. It can do the same for the inverted V, where it calculates the inverted V for either 20 degrees, 32 degrees, or 45 degrees, as well as calculating for a vertical, where it gives our vertical length as well as our radial length. The iTunes App Store has a lot of amateur radio apps that are available. This video is just to give you a quick look at what's available for ham radio in the App Store. I hope this video has been helpful. And 7 threes from N9LVS. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, we do have some good news, too. Dan also produced an Android version, and he's posting the link to it uh, along with all of tonight's videos at hamnationvideos.info. Well, next time on March 11th, we'll shoot for another Show Me Your Shack. We're a few sh photos short right now, so go ahead and send your shack photos in. We'll get them on the next episode. Uh, send them to Ham Nation Videos at TWIT.TV. And we can use a few videos if you've got those out there, too. We'll be joining Amanda in the chat room in a moment, but first... We're going to go get the latest news, find out about the latest contest from ICOM. From new models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commemorative label. 
For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and the large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID888H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. To hunker down or get out, the ID51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual bander has the free downloadable RSMS 1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D Plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Throw your name in the hat for some of the great swag prizes they're giving away, like T-shirts and hats. And you can also enter into the monthly grand prize drawing. If you go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation, you'll get the official rules. And you can check out all the uh, previous winners from previous months and last week as well. Uh, for February, the grand prize is going to be that ID51A Plus 5-watt dual-band dual-watch handy talkie with D-Star integrated GPS, automatic repeater list-up, and much more. So sign up and good luck, and don't forget to follow ICOM in America Incorporated on Facebook and on Twitter. That's icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And we want to thank ICOM for helping make Ham Nation possible. And now it's time to bring Amanda in and see what's going on in the chat room. Hey, good evening, George and everybody else out there. Uh, got some great questions tonight, by the way. And uh, for some announcements, let's go to VA3 ZTF Jeremy has upgraded to advanced. Um, big deal there. Congratulations. Congratulations, Jeremy, and I'm sorry that I forgot about it last week. And also, KA0VL Wyatt has also upgraded to extra here. So, congrats, you guys. Work that DX Yay! and make wow, some good great. contacts. Yahoo. That is great. And one announcement about a ham fest. George, KB0HVB, would like to announce that the Hiawatha, is that Hi Hiawatha? Radio? Hiawatha, Kansas. Yeah, Hiawatha. Yeah. That's where well, the yellow brick saying, road is. Hiawatha. Uh, yeah. He's saying Perry, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so stunned? <laughs> uh, well, she's at Hiawatha's Kansas, right? <laughs> this, is, this is Iowa? <laughs> Hiawatha Amateur Radio Club in oh, Perry, okay. Iowa. So oh, Iowa. maybe. Okay. Oh, right. Um, winter <laughs> RFS there this weekend. Anyhow, moving on. Uh, <laughs> you guys that's the only thing okay. I'm wrong about today. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. Hey, Gordo, I got a, a very important question for you. So we've always been told we need to have a copy of our license on us at all times. Now, in the digital age of our smartphones and everything else, is that actually necessary anymore? Um, on the smartphone, it is fine. Uh, you do not have to have a paper copy. In fact, now, as of the 17th, the FCC routinely does not issue paper copies. So, no, as long as you know your call sign and you have a way of looking it up to show them on your smartphone, it will be fine. And do, do you think that includes VE sessions? Um, at a VE session, they will probably want a hard copy of the license. So if you're taking an upgrade exam, better bring a uh, copy either from the FCC files or an old FCC license, and that'll make the VEs very happy with the upgrade. I wonder okay. if a printout from QRZ would uh, would work for that, for, um, for, for your license. Gordon, do you think a printout from QRZ, from a QRZ page? Uh, not certainly, print, the QRZ not print. page would uh, confirm that they're licensed, but the VEs have to turn that in with their paperwork. Yeah. So uh, they're going to really want the applicant to bring a copy of their own license. 
which I think you can still request from the FCC. I think they will print those out or send you a send you a a copy. I think if you request it, of course, you can all also go to the FCC ULS page and print that whole thing out, and that should be good enough for VEs, I would think. Absolutamente. Back to you. I think so, too. Thanks, you guys, for the info. And uh, Chum Lee had asked this uh, question, KK6MLG. I said, well, you know, I kind of thought the same thing about insurance now. Do you actually have to have a hard copy in your car if you could just show the person that you have insurance? But, hey, I don't know. Maybe I can not. answer that um, question. I can answer oh, that question. The question is, no, you do not, as long as it's on your on your phone. And the insurance company I have, which shall remain nameless, but their lizard is a spokesperson, um, <laughs> you do not. And I can I can I can tell you from from personal experience when I totaled my car out in September, I showed the the wonderful sheriff's officer the the app on my phone with the uh, uh, proof of insurance, and he copied the number down, and I was more or less good to go. Not good to drive because my car was total, but I was good to mm. go somewhere. <laughs> now, go let, me just, car. <laughs> let me just put this disclaimer out there. Every state is probably different. So please don't yeah. listen to Don Wilbanks about um, <laughs> legal expertise. Uh, no, that, that, actually, no. Uh, the Geico app. Uh, again, I have Geico and and that is exactly what that's for. So you don't have to carry a, a paper copy. You can have it right on your phone because everyone has a phone, but you know, there's nothing worse than trying to shuffle around and, and look in your glove box or, or wherever for the paper copy. And right. suppose you renewed your insurance, you forgot to put it in there. As yep. long as you have that app on your phone and it's available, and, and not all insurance companies do that, but mine does, Geico. And so I used it and it worked. So <laughs> I agree. Plus, try to look in a woman's purse anytime to try to find an insurance card. Forget it. I try to avoid um, that. <laughs> yeah. At all costs. That is so funny. Um, thank you so much, Don. I appreciate that. Hey, you guys, uh, just a couple of other questions. Loved the new ham series here. So with that in mind, I thought of a group question. And I know this could be hard. I remember mine completely. But hey, let's go through the group. Who remembers their first HF contact? Um, let's start with Gordo. We'll go to George and then Don. Uh, Gordo, do you remember your first HF contact? What was it like? Um, I think it was with Marconi. No, no, no. I guess that was uh, before <laughs> then. Uh, no, my first HF contact was on six meters, and it was AM, and uh, I remember it. And how about you, Chris? What was yours? Uh, my, my first contact on HF was on 10 meter. I just got my tech license. I bought an FT897 and got up on 10, and it was a local contact. So we remember. That, that's cool that you remember. Uh, George, what about you? I don't remember, but my logbook does. If if I was within reach of it, I could tell you, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not. So I I really don't remember. I know it was probably on 80 meters, but that's all I remember. Okay, uh, Don, what about you? I, I mine was local as well. Probably on 10 was probably um, W5HR on on 10 meters, more than likely. Uh, who was a good friend of mine in the club across town. I remember. My two most memorable 10-meter uh, contacts as a Tech Plus back then, uh, they were a mobile 25 watts with a unit in HR 2510 to Japan and Australia. Mobile. That was cool. Wow. wow that is, that's pretty amazing. I can remember my first HF contact was um, actually on 6 meters, and it was during the 6-meter UHF VHF contest and back in 2009. And I was so excited to work Texas. It was unbelievable. And uh, I can remember my first HF um, general contact. And that was on a traffic net. And I uh, worked a good friend. He's now a good friend. He wasn't at the time. And uh, he had given me a 5-9 signal and given Jeff a 5-7. So from the same station, of course, I sounded better. Um, so well, I loved yeah. it. Of course. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, those, those kind of things are, are just memorable to us. And once you guys, if you're not 
a general yet and you upgrade, you're going to remember it. And technician, when you get on six HF uh, or 10 meters HF, you're going to remember it. So, and your opportunities are coming up, by the way, with the DX contest. I can't wait for Val to be here next week to talk about giving us tips on how to make the DX contest go better. So, hey, you guys, with that, that's all I've got. Nice to see Bob tonight. And uh, thank you, Christian, for uh, your introduction to a new ham. Um, take it away, uh, Don. Okay. Yeah. Cool stuff. Good. And look what I got, Christian. I meant I, I shot at the five thirty earlier, but look, I got a couple of the, the newer ones here. These are these are just All right. slick. I love these. These are great for ham fest because they're so small, and you know you don't need much at a for just for local ham fest. I, and and they're great for repeaters too if you're close enough. But yeah, these little VX two and uh, the VX three. These are these are nice. I like these. I've always been a big fan of uh, of Yezu handhelds. So that, all the way back from that five thirty, the first real radio I ever bought was a. Yezu 530. Very cool. So I think that about does it. Uh, who's got the information on the nets? I know the D-Star net uh, is going to be on 14 Charlie, Reflector 14 Charlie. The uh, Echo Link is on Do Drop In, which is uh, 355800, node number on uh, on Echo Link. And uh, who's got the HF nets? George, you? Uh, 20 meters is going to be on 14.268. I already did my check-in before the show started. So uh, check them out there. If the band hadn't closed, they're, they're still up and running. 40 meters, I don't know, but I, I bet Gordo does. Uh, I think we'll probably be around 72.78. So we're going to take the new 991. And uh, Chris, let's put it on 72.78 or thereabouts. Cool. And if you can't, if you don't have a D-Star radio but you want to listen... HamNationDStar.net on the internet. You can listen to uh, to the D-Star net. So, yeah, a good show tonight. Glad Bob could come in tonight and uh, and the new ham stuff and uh, and just yeah, just awesome stuff and uh, just good stuff all the way around. So, I guess that'll just about do it for us tonight. So, for all of us here on Ham Nation, we wish you a very good night and we will see you again next week. So, seventy three, everybody. Seventy three. 